Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Monday, August 5th. We have to stand up and do a hell of a lot more than we've done in a very long time. Chicago's response to a weekend of carnage. Hate has no place in America. The president denounces hateful rhetoric after two mass shootings, but stops short of offering new gun control measures. By extending this tax credit through at least 2026, we're guaranteeing that these jobs aren't going away anytime soon. The heads of the Illinois and Chicago film offices on the state's film tax credit extension. A behind the scenes look at the cutting edge bionics being created at Chicago's Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Who here would abolish their private health insurance in favor of a government-run plan? As political candidates spar over health care, one journalist gathers startling personal stories about medical costs. Could you imagine life without the like button? One local artist is taking the metrics out of social media. And when there's a jazz band on stage, there's often an artist in the crowd. Hear from a Chicagoan who obsessively draws the area's jazz scene. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. Markets react to a tariff dispute between the U.S. and China. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. That's right, Phil. A rough day for investors as Wall Street stocks make their worst decline of the year down 3%. This comes as China counters President Donald Trump's latest tariff threats by devaluing its currency to the lowest level against the dollar in 11 years, a move the president called currency manipulation. China also halted purchases of U.S. farm products. Technology companies and banks bore the brunt of the sell-off. The Dow lost more than 767 points, or 2.9%. Singer R. Kelly is facing even more criminal charges tonight, this time out of the state of Minnesota. Authorities in Hennepin County say in 2001, Kelly was doing promotional work in Minneapolis when he offered a girl under the age of 18 $200 to take off her clothes and dance for him. The county attorney says Kelly faces two felony charges, prostitution and solicitation involving a girl under 18. This kind of conduct particularly juveniles, is simply not acceptable in the state of Minnesota or, frankly, anywhere. She was a juvenile at the time. We have special laws to protect our juveniles, and we are going to enforce them. Kelly's attorney, Steve Greenberg, tweeted, quote, Give me a break. This is beyond absurd. The 52-year-old is still jailed in New York, facing federal charges to which he's pleaded not guilty, and he's separately charged with child pornography here in Cook County. Well, how much would you pay for a 1984 Chicago Cubs baseball signed by Ryan Sandberg? What about original tickets to the 1893 World Columbia Exposition? Those and more than 200 other rare items were on display today ahead of a live auction next week during the Illinois State Fair. The state treasurer's office says after 10 years of trying to reunite the items with their owners, they'll be auctioned with the proceeds being held for the rightful owners in perpetuity. They're valued at a total of more than $150,000. And here's a sweet story. If you love a good donut, Krispy Kreme Donuts is setting up shop in Chicagoland with the first Chicago location on the Pedway level of Block 37, supplying donut lovers with fresh donuts twice a day. The iconic sweet treat maker is headquartered in North Carolina and has 1,400 retail shops in 33 countries and closer to home in Homewood, Evergreen Park, and Hillside. Four more are expected in the Chicagoland area this year. Who's hungry? As for the weather, a chance of showers and storms overnight with a low around 70, and tomorrow another chance of rain and thunderstorms, otherwise partly sunny with a high near 84. Now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Brandis. As you probably know, dozens of people were killed and wounded in mass shootings in Dayton, Ohio, and El Paso, Texas over the weekend. And here in Chicago, it was the most violent weekend of the year, leaving seven people dead from shootings. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here to talk about how the city's leaders are reacting. Amanda. 
Phil, the circumstances that are surrounding these tragedies are different, but they have the same heartbreaking fatal results. Local leaders responding with condolences, but also calls for action, including Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot imploring President Donald Trump to set a better, clear, moral tone. Because what he's been doing is blowing every racist, xenophobic dog whistle. And when you do that, when you blow that kind of dog whistle, animals come out. So what I would like to see him do is to set a different moral frame that provides for people to be able to come together, that respects the importance of helping communities heal, and to use not just the bully pulpit of his office, but his weight in Congress to move forward on common sense gun reform. Lightfoot's remarks came after Trump in televised remarks condemned racism and bigotry and called for laws that would flag individuals who are mentally ill and should not be allowed to have guns. Dismissals of, well, that's just some crazy person, which is what he's seemingly doing, I think completely undermines the realities of what's happening out there. The mayor questioning how such red flag laws could work without universal background checks in place. Also, the ability of people to travel across state lines and purchase guns at what she called an alarming rate. Lightfoot's remarks also came after she had just met with mental health, uh, health experts about coordinating how Chicago handles violence-induced trauma. The level of trauma, the level of violence is so frequent that what we have to do is think different. We have to provide real infrastructure <clears throat> with staying power so that we can help these communities start to heal. And this cannot just be a law enforcement only response. We've spent over the years probably <clears throat> hundreds of millions of dollars policing on the west side. CPD, federal and state law enforcement, and we have barely moved the needle. Still, what about reaction from the Chicago Police Department? Any reaction from law enforcement? Yes, Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson said that the United States has the power, ability, and the resources to address gun violence, but he questioned whether the nation has the will to use it. Closer to home, he once again vented his frustration that police are catching people carrying guns illegally only for the offenders to be quickly released on bail. Today, police unveiling a database that seeks to drive home this narrative. The gun offender dashboard shows details about any adult arrested for a gun related felony, including possession, since May. According to the CPD, in that time, there's been 1,105 firearm related felony arrests. Of those, all but 10 have posted bond out of Cook County. Johnson says Chicago needs to create a culture of accountability and still fear, in other words, of getting caught with an illegal gun. I just think that we have to create a culture of accountability in the city. You know, we have to let people know that, that continuously want to pick up illegal weapons and use them. We have to let them know there's going to be some accountability, you know, and right now I don't think we have that, you know, because we keep seeing the same people. This has been getting a lot of tension lately. In 2017, Chicago's top judge ordered the courts make a concerted effort to move away from money-based bail. Backers say it's doing well, and they say court data shows few, less than 1% of people released from jail on felony charges are then rearrested for a violent offense. The police superintendent's comments sort of boil down to a desire to punish people while they're still presumed innocent. So everyone who's receiving a bond is still going to face a trial. The case doesn't end um, when someone is released on bond or they post a monetary bond or if they're detained in the jail pre-trial. So Illinois still has some of the toughest or the harshest sentences for mere gun possession in the country. We are scheduled to have Chief Judge Tim Evans on Chicago tonight, this Thursday, for more on this topic. Now, briefly before we go, I want to circle back to this call for red flag gun laws intended to keep firearms from those whose behavior portends they're harming themselves or others. This idea got a lot of attention last year after a man from Illinois killed four people at a Tennessee Waffle House. Now, Governor J.B. Pritzker today did call for gun control, but red flag legislation stalled in the state legislature this past year, and there's been no movement on it since. Amanda, thank you.
And now to Brandis Friedman and the challenge of tracking uh, issues of violence nationwide. Brandis. And Phil, at least 31 reported dead so far after mass shootings over the weekend in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. The suspected gunman in El Paso was reportedly motivated by white nationalist anti-immigrant rhetoric. And the shooter in Dayton, described by some today as a troubled young man, fixated on killing. President Donald Trump condemned hate but said hateful rhetoric and mental illness are to blame for the carnage, not guns. Joining us to discuss the latest in this long string of mass shootings in the U.S. are Tom Mekaitis, a professor of history at DePaul University and author of Violent Extremists, Understanding the Domestic and International Terrorist Threat. Alex Medina, president of the Illinois Association of Hispanic State Employees, an effort out of the Illinois Latino agenda. David Goldenberg, Midwest Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League, and Colleen Cicchetti, Executive Director of the Lurie Children's Hospital's Center for Childhood Resilience, which connects children, including those exposed to trauma, with mental health services. All of you, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Tom, let's start with you, please. You say that after the El Paso shooting, that it's time to treat white mm -hmm. supremacy as domestic terrorism. Why is that? Because what we're looking at is a comprehensive, pervasive, ideological threat that manifests itself in individual crimes that are often reported as hate crimes or merely as ordinary murders and assaults. And we need to see them in, in aggregate as manifestations of the same problem. And I'm pleased that we've finally taken a step to do that. Alex Medina, the reported anti-Latino, anti-immigrant rhetoric from the El Paso shooter, uh, how do you effectively counter that mindset? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think uh, that we all are called to come together mm -hmm. and engage and converse. I think at the, uh, at, the, at, at the end of the day, it boils down to a, a human issue. And I think that the uh, rhetoric at the present time is distancing, deviating us, deceiving us, misleading us, from what it truly is to be a human being. So I think we first need to start there. And second, I think we also need to acknowledge each, each other's individu individual individu individuality, uh, virtuosity, dignity, and sense of humanity. If we take those steps, I think we're at a good place to start uh, pursuing uh, 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 peaceful solutions. Uh, nevertheless, we also have to be bold. We also have to be courageous. We cannot afford to be passive anymore. We cannot afford to normalize the crisis. I would say, personally speaking, that we are in an emergency mm -hmm. situation as a nation because the rhetoric that is at hand at this point in time is inspiring and fueling those people that are taking the steps almost as if they are given permission to go out and kill. Um, David Goldenberg, so obviously this is not just an El Paso problem. Um, the Anti-Defamation League, you all track the role of extremism and white nationalism playing in those shootings. What have you all found? We found that this attack here in El Paso was the most deadly attack by a white supremacist in over the last 50 years, and the third deadliest attack from an extremist perspective that we've had also in the 50 years, second only after the Oklahoma City bombing and the Pulse nightclub shootings in Orlando. And the reality is, is that when we look at sort of where this type of extremism is manifesting itself in 2018, according to the FBI and our own statistics, that 49 of the 50 extremist murders were coming from right-wing extremist organizations. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a significant problem here. And the reality is, is that, as Tom mentioned, you know, the individual involved in El Paso had ties and was inspired by, um, it appears to be inspired by different websites. Um, and that's a problem. And the reality is, is when you look at it, there's no marginalized community here that really isn't at risk. Whether you be black churchgoers in Charleston, Jewish uh, congregants in Poway or Pittsburgh, uh, Sikh congregants in, in Old Creek, um, and now what appear at now what it appears in, uh, in El Paso, targeting the Latino and immigrant communities, no one's safe right now. And this is a problem that is elevating, that is targeting people um, of all walks of life. Colleen Cicchetti, we hear a lot of talk about mental illness when these happen. And of course, the president blamed these shootings today on hatred and mental illness. What are your concerns uh, about the potential of stigmatizing mental health when we start that talk? I think it's a big, big concern. I think it's really um, not the direction that this conversation needs to be going. It, we know that mental illness and this kind of behavior are not correlated. There's a very, very small percentage of folks who 
do these activities or hurt people in these ways. And there are lots and lots of folks who experience mental illness and mental diagnoses that will never hurt anyone. And so I think it's confounding the conversation when we start mixing these two things up and blaming a mental illness when that's really not the issue. And while they're not necessarily a direct link, there are indications that in Dayton um, and in other mass shootings that there were young people um, who were struggling, they didn't get the care that they needed. Are we prepared to, um, are we well equipped to recognize and address the needs of, the, of young people who may have mental illness? Absolutely not. So I think those are two kind of separate things, but I think if we take a general public health approach to addressing mental health and wellness in general, we're going to be helping our citizens in lots of different ways. From my work, we really look at how do we think about adults that work with kids and equip them with knowledge of what are the signs and symptoms that a child is struggling, whether that be um, looking like they're withdrawing from friends or whether they're having other types of clinical symptoms that we would really want to look for how do we train everyone that's interacting with kids to think differently and to be sort of creating that protective shield of adults to say you look like a kid who's struggling how can i use the relationship that i might have with you whether that be as your girl scout leader or your you know your youth minister or your teacher to say what's going on with you how do i get you connected to services but we also then need to equip those frontline workers with knowledge about what are signs and symptoms where are services that you can link kids to because no one wants to raise a question that they don't feel that they know how to handle and so we really need to create, like you said, a web of behavioral health supports and invest in them like the mayor mentioned, but also you know, strategies for promoting you know, respect of one another, problem solving strategies, all those things that we can do as educators and other frontline staff working with kids. Go ahead. I was gonna say, even, <clears throat> even those that are not, and most mass shooters are not diagnosably mentally ill. <clears throat> when I work on counter-radicalization, exactly what you described is the same thing you look for. They may have no particular mental health issues, but there are still warning signs, just as we see warning signs for alcohol, drug abuse, interest in gangs or cults. We need to train those first people who have those contacts to spot that and to get those students out of those danger zones or those, any individual as soon as we can. David, how much of a response needs to be on the policy or the legislative sides, and how much is a matter of just a, you know, a change in, in rhetoric or a change in political discourse? Look, legislation can be done quickly. It can take a lot of time. We've seen a lot of things sit around for quite some time. We've seen things stall out in the current Congress. But the reality is, is that there's things that can be done immediately today. I mean, the president's remarks today were very, they were positive, right? Now the question is, is what are we gonna do moving forward, right? How do we have those remarks and eliminate that type of rhetoric when you're not in responding to a tragedy like we had in El Paso? How do you ensure that the rhetoric is not attacking immigrant and immigrant communities and those seeking asylum? Or targeting and attacking individuals based on their religious preference or their walk of life or their ethnic, or their ethnic background? The reality is, is this is a problem. How do you ensure that you're not dividing people and said uniting people? And how do you ensure though that when you're at rallies and you hear things like send them back or shoot them, that it's matched by things other than just a smirk, which we saw from a number of political leaders around the country. And that's a problem, that's a problem. And so it starts with there, immediately, that we can take action. That's something you can do today. Mm -hmm. That's something that can be done from the top all the way down. We have, we've had issues uh, in Illinois, we've had issues throughout the Midwest of leaders and elected officials who are using extreme rhetoric that doesn't bring us together, but instead seeks to divide us. Well, how does that get countered? I mean, is the expectation then, should you see lawmakers and other leaders um, respond in kind if there is a tweet or, because um, obviously it's one thing to have the positive language, but if someone else is spewing what you deem to not be positive, what should the exact response be from our leaders? So I think our leaders have to denounce it immediately. Mm -hmm. They have to denounce it. They have to explain why it's bad. And what you have to have also is we're looking for statements from not just those of opposite political parties, because that's easy. But we're looking for when extremism pops up on either side of the political spectrum, and it exists on either side of the political spectrum. But when it exists, how do people respond from those who might perhaps uh, have similar persuasions or similar types of political beliefs? Do you stand up and say, that's not OK? That's not who we are. That's not who we are as a nation. That's not who we are as people who stand up. And we think that it starts there. That is a first and an excellent good start. Hence, hence our conviction that this has to be driven from a humanistic point of view. It cannot be a political uh, point of view, although there are some significant uh, systemic trends 
that need to be addressed. Our association is something that, uh, that we take seriously, that we pursue. Uh, over 30 state agencies where uh, the number of Latino employees has not met compliance for over 32 years they have with, that we have been in existence. That's an issue. That's a systemic trend that we are trying to analyze and that we're trying to address as well with the leadership that is in place. But however, I think our, our stand as an association is to pursue this from a human point of view. Because if it gets uh, polarized, then you will go and tend to go to the extreme because you're going to try to defend that which you have a strong conviction for. Uh, so I think uh, as we move forward as an association, we're trying to engage the, uh, the General Assembly. We're trying to engage external sources as well and bringing, in, bringing them in into a, a context of relationship centered around human, human values, human virtues, which nowadays we're beginning to lose or to even have a, a no concept or definition over what it is trust, what's trust. Well, it was wonderful to have heard the president say what he said today. Do I trust him? No, I do not. Why? Because I have the track record to go by. Just two weeks ago, he was after, after four amazing Congress uh, women, correct? He was pretty straightforward as he was uh, inaugurating his uh, campaign. The, those that were present were chanting. Send her back, send her back. And I'm a smirk on his face. Do I trust that kind of system? I do not. Tom. Yeah, the thing, I, and I, I agree. And we're with, almost out of time, but please. I agree with a lot of that. But the, the thing is, too, is <clears throat> what he has helped to do and what is so disturbing is he has moved what used to be marginalized, objectionable rhetoric into mainstream political discourse. And a lot of it is by using coded racism. Oh, I'm not anti-Latino, I just want secure borders. I'm not racist, I just celebrate European heritage. You know, I'm not anti-Semitic, and you rail about elites, you know. Um, even the term mentally ill, we were talking about it before, is a way in a sense of deflecting, you know. And I, I think the rhetoric is very dangerous and it fuels the hatred that leads to the violence. And we'll have to leave it there and see if there's the political momentum to address the issues that you all have raised tonight. Thank you for joining us. Tom Mekaitis, Alex Medina, David Goldenberg, and Colleen Cicchetti. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, state-of-the-art bionics being created at a lab right here in Chicago. A local podcaster shares alarming stories about the high cost of health care. The metrics of social media might be unhealthy for its users, so one Illinois artist is posing solutions. And a Chicago artist compulsively chronicles the local jazz scene. But first, when you think of the film and TV industries, Chicago probably may not be the first place that comes to mind, but in recent years, the city has become a major player in attracting productions of all shapes and sizes. Now, with an extension of the Illinois film tax credit by Governor J.B. Pritzker, the state hopes to cement the industry's local foothold by giving film companies incentives lasting through the end of 2026. Here to talk more about the credit in the city and state film industry are Peter Hawley, director of the Illinois Film Office, and Kwame Amawaku, director of the Chicago Film Office, and welcome both to Chicago Tonight. Uh, first of all, Peter Hawley, describe what the Illinois Film Office does for people who may not be sure. familiar with you. What we largely do is we uh, oversee the tax credit. You know, if we don't do anything else but uh, check, uh, make sure that the tax credit is working, that the incentives are getting to the people who apply for them. We are in the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, so it's about job creation and it's about uh, building the infrastructure, and that's really what we do. And uh, j just give me a quick beat on what the tax credit is. How does it work? Sure. 30% of all of your Illinois spend is re refundable in a tax credit. So simple math here, a million dollar film, uh, everything spent in Illinois, f crew, uh, 
salaries, all that sort of stuff, 30% goes back to the production company, and they can sell that, transfer that, et cetera. I see. And um, Kwame, how about the Chicago Film Office? What, what do you do that's different from what the Illinois Film Office does? Well, um, the Chicago Film Office is a part of DCASE, the Department of uh, Cultural Affairs and Special Events. We're tasked with um, production feature films, television, commercials, basically the nuts and bolts, the logistics, the interaction. We act as a liaison between the production and the city agencies. So we permit the films. Uh, if they need street closures, we connect them with police. Uh, we basically facilitate the actual filming of the projects on the streets of the city of Chicago. And uh, Peter, had the governor allowed that uh, tax credit not to be renewed, what, what would have happened? Bad news. I mean, th the film business would have gone away. I mean, he said it at the press conference on Thursday. Dick Wolf said it on Thursday that if this tax credit wasn't extended, we were going out of Chicago. I mean, we're, it's a competitive market. You know, we're competing with New York, Los Angeles, Toronto, Vancouver, Georgia, New Mexico, and without the tax credit incentive, they would leave here. And uh, Kwame, just a quick uh, thumbprint as to the economic impact that the film and television production industry has. What does it mean? It's pretty major. I mean, you know, you're talking in 2018, 13,848 jobs, 282 million in wages, 520 projects here in the city of Chicago. So that's a major economic impact. And in terms of the impact to the state? Well, the state, I mean, the film business here is half a billion dollars a year. We want to grow that to getting to a billion dollars in the next year and a half or so. And that's a lot of jobs. It's a lot of tax revenue that comes into the, the state. And we have to keep it going with the tax credit. You talked about the competitive nature of attracting film a films and uh, television production. Uh, what kinds of deals do other states offer? For example, well, a lot of states, uh, you know, Louisiana, Michigan, they actually have had problems with their tax credit. Michigan actually ran out of money. Kentucky ran out of money. Uh, Georgia famously brought in uh, essentially a film industry to Georgia because of a tax credit incentive, and they also uh, incentivize non-residents. Illinois doesn't incentivize non-residents. You have to be an Illinois resident or a vendor to take advantage of the tax credit. How but big a tax credit does Georgia get, for example? 20%, 20, 25%, yes. but they also go with the non-residents, so that's that many more. Crew that members. adds more. Yeah, I But, see. you know, because of the governor's progressive legislation, we've done a really good job of taking some work from Georgia because uh, Georgia has this very, uh, you know, restrictive reproductive, you know, bill that's reproductive rights bill that's out there right now. So people are looking to a state like Illinois to bring production here. Has, has that, uh, because Georgia has become a major site of, uh, of filming and television production, has that uh, restrictive abortion legislation had, had, uh, had a major impact? I mean, are people leaving or not going back to Georgia as a result of it? Uh, it they're taking a better look at other Absolutely. options, and Chicago's definitely at the top of that list of options that they're looking at. I, I can't I can't prove it, but I know that I get phone calls from HBO and other places saying as soon as Georgia came out with their law, I got a call the next day saying, give us everything you have on the Illinois Reproductive Health Act. Uh -huh. And they're looking at us. I see. Uh, well, look, with online streaming, there's an explosion of new TV shows and some specifics on how you might attract uh, television giants like Netflix and Amazon. Well, we really want to work on uh, bolstering the infrastructure here in town, building more stages, sound stages, more facilities. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a, if you build it, they will come uh, mentality here. And I think that if we can work on building more stages, more facilities, then more productions will come here. There's a lot of advantages to shooting in the city of Chicago. The rapper Common has proposed building massive studios in Chicago's far south side. Is that, uh, are you behind that idea? A hundred percent. Definitely. We need the infrastructure. Uh, the neighborhood needs the economic development. It's a win-win for everybody. What's the likelihood that could happen, Peter? I think, I think a very good likelihood. We're trying to bring together a group of investors and studios to uh, the state to talk about building in economic opportunity zones, taking advantage of those opportunities. I, I know that because of the peak TV, as they call it, there's you know 500 TV series being produced right now. Studios in LA are looking around the world for production space. Mm. Uh, Disney, I was in LA in June. Disney said, we're looking around the world. Fox is looking, Empire is leaving. You know, This is the last season of Empire. Fox is keeping those stages. They're gonna put another show in there. They need stage space, and that's what we do. We try to build the infrastructure. Kwame, you mentioned the economic benefits of having these production uh, crews in town. Uh, any other benefits besides dollars and cents? Well, I mean, it, it definitely establishes the city as a cultural destination. I mean, it's it's 
it's about most of the time the city is a character in these shows and you know these shows do an excellent job of bringing positive light to the city they find areas that haven't really been exploited in these neighborhoods and they show them and that gives uh, the city a higher profile and gives the city a much better look. Is there a particular show that, uh, that the two of you are particularly keen on that's shot in, uh, in Chicago, Kwame? I love them all. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, name your favorite child, right? Uh, yeah. I have one that's coming up. Uh, Candyman, uh, Jordan Peele's producing. It's the sequel, it's the remake of Candyman, which was set in Cabrini Green 25 years ago. Jordan Peele's producing it. It's called Candyman or Say My Name, which is the new title. That starts shooting in a couple of weeks. That'll be out next year. That's, that's my pick for, uh, if we're Cisco and Ebert here, <laughs> that's my pick. Yeah. Uh, P Peter, as you know, the former Teamsters Union Chief John uh, Coley recently mm -hmm. pled guilty to extorting mm -hmm. uh, Cinespace Production Studios in the southwest side. That's right. one of the major facilities in town. Um, might this case have a chilling effect on other companies that might want to do business in Chicago? I, I don't think so. And, and the governor last week at the press conference said very well, I thought, that it's, uh, you know, it, it's a bad apple. It, it's not, you know, indicative of the film industry in Chicago and in Illinois. And I think that that's a mistake. I think, you know, we have great relationships with all the unions here and the studios. They know what's going on, and I don't think it's going to be a problem. Both of you have experience um, in, in personal experience with productions. Does that help you uh, in terms of making your job easier? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, how it, so? It, well, it bec because I can identify with these productions, okay. I understand their needs, and it, it allows me to approach the city agencies and address their needs in a much more informed way so that I can explain to them why they need to shut this street down why they needed this particular time. It allows me to be much more articulate about the needs of productions. Peter, Kwame, thank you both for being here. Very much appreciate your sharing your experiences and insights. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. The trauma of losing a limb is hard to imagine, but advances in prosthetics means that in the not too distant future, it's possible that people who have lost a limb could receive a fully functional robotic replacement. And a lab in Chicago is leading the way to that future. In a state-of-the-art facility in downtown Chicago, the next generation of bionic prosthetics are being developed at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Terry Karpowitz, who lost his leg in a motorcycle accident some 40 years ago, has been working with a team of engineers and clinicians to help develop a new bionic leg and is excited about what it could do for him. I'm a sculptor, so I need my hands um, and having a, a leg. Uh, to allow my hands to be free is, you know, everything. Carperwood says compared to previous prosthetics he has used, which were not motorized, this bionic limb allows him to walk with a natural gait and even manage stairs. You just saw what it does best. This is, is probably 50% better because it allows me to save energy. It, 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 it helps me move as opposed to me initiating the, um, uh, the muscle movement to get to pull it along. Levi Hargrove is the director of the Ability Lab Center for Bionic Medicine. I've been here for around 11 years now, focused my research in um, coming up with better ways to control bionic legs and arms. One of the unique things about the leg that Karpowitz is helping test and evaluate is that its makers have made the design open source, meaning other researchers can copy the design and work to improve it. So what we're really working on is making it smooth um, and intuitive and seamless so that when Terry takes a step, whether he's walking on level ground or going up and down slopes or stairs, it'll respond to his intentions. To make that possible, the leg has 64 sensors that measure all aspects of its movement. Artificial intelligence and machine learning allow the device to learn the user's walking patterns. Every step, it learns a little bit more about Terry and responds to his intentions a little bit better. So we're teaching the computer to respond to Terry or whoever else would use this leg. They would learn their, their habits a little bit better. In fact, according to Hargrove, yeah. this latest prototype, which was initially funded by the U.S. Army and now by the National Institutes of Health, is so as advanced as it gets and is the culmination of more than a decade of work. But his team, which includes collaborators from the University of Michigan, is constantly developing ways to improve it, especially it. making it lighter and more robust. 
we want to make sure that, that Terry has the freedom to, to move wherever he wants to move um, because we're so confident in the hardware that we don't have to worry about something breaking. And another project that we're very excited about is um, we're going to put the sensors inside of, of the, the body. So perhaps not with Terry, but with someone, we're going to have little pill-like sensors that we inject inside of their muscle and we'll read the signals from the inside as opposed to the outside. Hargrove says one of the reasons the Ability Lab has been so successful in advancing prosthetic design is that it brings together scientists, engineers, clinicians, and patients in one space. And so being able to bring all of that together in one group uh, at the same time is really impactful, and it allows us to make advancements that otherwise would take, you know, decades or, or at least um, num a number of years relatively quickly. Ultimately, the goal is to make prosthetics so reliable that they will need scarcely any maintenance. Kind of like a, if you think of a vehicle, um, you might need to uh, take it in for servicing at once a year. You don't want to take it in for servicing once a day. And while it still may be a year or two before Karpowitz is able to take a new leg home, he's eager to see how it will change his life. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, to turning me loose in the studio and seeing, uh, you know, what it can do for me in terms of um, making my life easier. Let me show you the stairs again. <laughs> and Karpowitz has promised that when he does finally get to take a new bionic leg home, he'll let us come. He'll let us come and see how he is doing. And back with more in a moment. <laughs> Coverage of Science and Technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, President of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. As you know, health care costs have been a focus in the Democratic presidential debates. A recent Gallup poll found that Americans borrow $88 billion last year to pay for health care, and that one in four adults skip medical treatments altogether because of the cost. Our next guest has heard his share of health care horror stories, from a woman who takes a drug that costs half a million dollars to a couple drop from their insurance just before the wife is scheduled to give birth. It's all in the podcast called An Arm and a Leg. And its host and creator Dan Weissman joins us now. Dan, good to see you. And first of all, uh, how did you decide to start this podcast? It's <laughs> a good question. Well, you know, as a reporter and as just a guy walking around, I've seen this as a giant story for a long time. I mean, as a guy walking around, in my family, we made giant career decisions based on like, well, what's the health insurance like? Well, how can we, I don't know, can we do that if we don't have the right health insurance? And as a reporter, I've been pitching for years. These are stories that affect almost everybody. They're stories about our bodies and our checkbooks, so they're super intimate. They're stories about like sickness and health and life and death. They're really dramatic, and they affect, it's like a fifth of our economy. They're the biggest kind of political and economic decisions, so they're kind of like, they ring all the bells as a reporter. And your podcast focuses on individual stories. Yeah. Uh, for example, there's one about a mom who had to move to a different state because of the price of medication. Uh, give us the details on that. Laura Derrick, she's an amazing person, and she had lived with a kind of immune system disorder her, almost her whole life and had been diagnosed around age 30 and had waited like 10, 15 years for effective treatment to become available in the United States. And when it did, it finally did, became available to her because her insurance covered it. Um, she felt great and a month later, three things happened. One was her son was diagnosed with type one diabetes while he was mm. finishing college. The second was her husband was diagnosed with late stage cancer. Mm. And he was, he had Gosh. this incredible drug, several jobs, none of them came with health insurance. And there's this other thing about her, which is she had been galvanized after seeing Barack Obama so would ramp up their campaign. Campaign for her, her husband recovered.